Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. The local time is 8.48 a.m. And we will begin our program this morning on George Otis Smith at 9 a.m., top of the hour. Thank you for joining us. How are we all doing this morning? Y'all feeling okay? It's a very pleasant morning here. Sun's out now. It was all overcast uh, 20 minutes ago. The weather's coming from the south. We got some thunderstorms in the forecast, but that's a rarity here. The Cascades are getting hammered right now. It's like very warm this morning, it's over 70 degrees um, at nine o'clock in the morning. That's very rare for us. <clears throat> Looks like we're doing okay. Let me say hi to a few folks here. Did I see South America or was that South Africa? That went too fast. Edinburgh, good morning. New Hampshire, Georgia. You're having thunderstorms now, Mina. That's good. Uh, Moto JW, I'm going to be uh, sending you a message today. Got something I want to talk to you about. Uh, Cardiff, Ohio, Mexico. Hey, Ray. Welcome. Uh, yeah, do we? Uh, Netherlands, good. Yes, the folks at a reasonable hour there in uh, in Europe and and. Uh, uh, even uh, Qatar, oh man, this is, uh, I'm loving this. I gotta love it. UK, UK, Finland, another Netherlands, the Netherlands. I, uh, Switzerland, hey now. I hope you guys aren't pulling my leg. Uh, another Wenatchee, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fun. It is darn fun to have um, folks from that part of the world. Belgium, oh, this is great. No offense, North Americans. I mean, I know, I know that we normally deal with uh, each other live on weeknights here, but um, the whole point of moving these, I was actually looking back to when we started these, and I, I didn't have any morning shows for a while. I'd kind of forgotten that. And then I think I got enough messages from folks in, in Europe that said, hey, it's the middle of the night when it's 6 p.m. your time. Would you please think about doing a couple, another UK, another in the morning? So that, that's what got us rolling. And I, um, I forget when we made that switch, but it's a thrill to see, to see so many of you from, uh, from distant places. Yeah, things are opening up here a little bit. We moved to phase two uh, a few days ago. My wife is thrilled this morning. She's in a great mood because she gets to go downtown and do yoga at her friend's studio instead of doing Zoom uh, upstairs. So it's just me and Bijou this morning. She's downtown. We've got a farmer's market that's on Saturday mornings and they're, you know, of course, complying with a bunch of rules and face masks and everything else, but uh, there's signs of moving in the right direction here in my town. I'm not sure about your your town. And yes, Jaime Gutierrez, my barber. He owns Northwest Barbers, downtown Ellensburg. You gotta love it. Jaime is back in business. Uh, he's a wonderful guy, local business owner and so I said, he said, the usual? He said, oh, good Lord. I haven't been watching your live streams. I didn't realize your hair was that long. I could have guessed. And I said, hi, May. I think we're keeping the curls. Germany. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Elm, Switzerland. Yeah. Oh, you were from El uh, some Switzerland? Yeah, all, all, my, all my people came from one small town in Switzerland, Elm, Switzerland. Uh, let's look at the schedule, I guess. I'm not sure why, but it's, it's, it's routine. So many of you have been, you don't miss, and that's, I, I'm grateful for that. Others kind of maybe take the weekends to get caught up if they miss some shows. So here's what we've been doing this week. Ice cores in the backyard. Frenchman Cooley was our first field trip. Saddle Mountains was in the backyard with uh, Liz and a friend drinking wine. This morning we're talking about George Otis Smith, and tomorrow morning... I don't know, the forecast looks pretty pretty windy, so I might be in the front porch, I'm not sure, for uh, Pacific Northwest Tectonics. I've got a plan. A number of you actually have, have requested something like that, where I take all these concepts and kind of organize them and put them in order uh, so that we don't mix up Baja BC and Chalice Magmas and Celestia and that kind of stuff. So I don't want to say tomorrow is review, but it's uh, occasionally we'll, we'll kind of do things like that, I suppose. We've been doing enough of these live streams that there's enough content out there that it might be helpful to revisit a few things and put them together in, in new ways. Okay, I saw that word that I just hate to see, uh, buffering. So let me just pause for just a second. Uh, can I make sure that we're uh, are we doing okay? There's nobody else here. It's just me using the usual Wi-Fi, so I'm guessing that we're good. Five by five? Okay. So if y'all have buffering or y'all have, if it's fuzzy or if it, it is not synced up or whatever, uh, I think re hit your refresh button or, or, uh, make a couple other adjust adjustments on your end, but looks like things are working pretty well. It's 99% good for me. Okay. <laughs> My lips are in sync. That's nice to hear. I've gotten some questions about the, the oil derricks over there in the grass. Uh, Liz and a friend of hers built those, and we have tomato plants over in the garden. So when the tomato plants get yay high, then uh, she plants the uh, oil derrick so that the tomato plants have a little structure, support, because this is a windy place. Anything else I can help you with this morning? Hello, San Diego. <clears throat> Let me check my laptop real quick. Okay, people are rolling in here. We're over 400 now, good. Um, it's just a very peaceful morning. Oh, Washingtonians are showing up left and right now. People always checking in. It's always fun to re watch the replays. The replays for me have been coming almost immediately, just what, what, 30 minutes after we're done and the, the comments are there. I've been very pleased with that. You know, we had trouble for a while. I don't know what happened there. Been getting some emails from software engineers and other folks with kind of technology uh, help. I'm very appreciative of that. Been hearing from some artists and some animators and they're offering to uh, come at some of this from their point of view. It's uh, 
It's amazing. Oh, the lost chat. Yeah, I never did solve that. We only had one of these live streams called Slow Earthquakes. And I was particularly interested in reading your comments in replay. And I guess that night, YouTube was having a problem. I don't know, maybe I'll email that, that software per I can't remember who he said he worked for, but he seems to know everything about buffering and tips and may maybe he can help me. I'd love to restore those live comments for the Slow Earthquakes show, but haven't been able to figure it out on my end, but there was a ton of love for Walter. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I, I emailed him the link and I said, hey, I think it went well. Um, and he said, yeah, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> and I wanted to share all the comments with him. And uh, they're just not there. That's the only show. You notice I bring in a, an expert when I am totally over my head. That's the case there for sure. All right, we're approaching 500 folks. Uh, I've never really noticed kind of how people trickle in uh, as we approach this. I'm usually so preoccupied with other things. I keep reading about that or hearing that. Cell phone extenders and why don't you get a booster? I don't know anything about that. Is that a thing? And then, of course, everybody says, Google it. You know, do your research. Like, I, I got other things to do. I'm not going to spend time doing that maybe I should it's like a mobile hotspot even that confuses me <laughs> all right yep oh it's nine o'clock hey give me one minute would you let me just focus thank you thank you for joining us this morning hope you enjoy the program Well, a pleasant good morning to you all. Uh, welcome to my backyard. Uh, this is yet another live stream. And this morning's uh, episode uh, is unusual. And I hope that you're willing to kind of play along with this, with this kind of a program. We're going to talk about this fellow right here, George Otis Smith. And um, here's what he looks like. George Otis Smith. So to get into this, and to try to share with you why I think it's worth a full morning talking about this fellow, especially since I knew hardly anything about him 24 hours ago. I actually want to start with a, with a little, I guess it's a story. Um, I listen to a lot of music. I'm sure you do too. Most of the time the music is just kind of in the background and you don't pay a whole lot of attention to it and it just kind of sets the mood. But every once in a while, it's, it's not common for me, it's rare, uh, but every once in a while, the timing is right, or I don't know, I had a good breakfast, or I don't know what it was, but I, there's a song that will come on, and this can be any work of art, by the way, it doesn't have to be music, but let's just say song, okay? A song will come on, whether it's on Apple Music or Spotify or something, and I'll just stop. Like, it will stop me dead in my tracks. And I'm like, what is this? I've never heard anything like this. And I'm just, for that four minutes, I'm just completely connected with that person. Whether it's a singer or the songwriter or singer-songwriter or whatever. 
Are you like that? Are you kind of, are your receptors open to stuff like that? And, and you feel it so deeply and it's so intimate and it's so personal. Well, for me, and maybe now not many of you can relate, but if I have that experience and it's one song, especially if it's from decades ago, and everybody in that recording studio has passed away and the singer has passed away, and yet there's this communication, there's this connection. My instinct is to do research. I want to know everything about that person. Let's say it's a singer-songwriter. I, I, want, I want to know everything about that person's life up until the time that they recorded that song. I want to know where they were recording it. I want to know what everybody had for breakfast. I mean, I want to know everything I can. And my point is, my first point this morning is, for me, if something resonates with me right here, I want all the other stuff. I want context. I want broad, I want a broad idea of that person so that I can enjoy that little moment even more. And now maybe that's just a few of you, but that's my instinct. Right now, currently, I'm into Norley, who is a Danish woman who is riding around the world with a motorbike. And she has amazing abilities to capture her, her journey with, with cameras. She's in quarantine right now, but, but I've, I've, been de I've done a deep dive into Norley. If you've never heard of it, Itchy Boots, Itchy Boots YouTube channel. She's amazing. Well, I did my deep dive on her, re learned what I could, read everything I could. She's a geologist. Of course I liked her. Rotterdam, got into geology, was an exploration geologist for a while, sold everything, started doing this motorbike thing. So that's me. I need the context. Okay. So was George Otis Smith riding his motorbike around the world? No. Was he a singer-songwriter? Is this Joni Mitchell? No. So how, why do I start to talk on George Otis, George Otis Smith like this? Let me show you. I've had this on my bookshelf for 30 years. And you'll notice it's an original from 1903. I'm gonna zoom in now for you. So there's handwriting here. So that pencil scratching is George Beck. So George Beck taught at my college. He was the only geologist in the department from 1925 till 1960. So this was his copy of this report by George Otis Smith, Geology and Physiography of Central Washington. And there's a second piece in here by Bailey Willis talking about Wenatchee Chelan District, 1903. And so Beck gave his copy to Edward Clucking. Clucking was the successor for Beck. Clucking taught at my school as a geologist slash botanist for 30 years, 1960 to 1992, and then Bud gave me this copy, so I've had it in my office. So, you know, occasionally, every few years, maybe I'll say, oh, yeah, I got this thing on my shelf. Let me open it up. I don't, who's George Otis Smith? No idea. Why was he here in 1903? I wonder if I can do a deep dive on George Otis Smith. What was happening before his life? What was happening after his time here? And uh, let me give you a feeling for the scale of this. I'll, I'll handle it very carefully. Beautiful maps from the turn of the century, before the Sunset Highway, before Bing Crosby, before J. Harlan Britz. Let me give you a little bit more. Look at this. So I filmed a two minute geology video right at this spot with Tom Foster in 2012. And here's George Otis Smith and his field assistants, Frank Calkins, standing there in the summer of 1900. And I don't know if they had artistic ability or they hired somebody to do it after the fact. I'll just show you a little bit more. This is what got me into George Otis Smith. And 
I'm a busy guy during the school year. I always go, God, I should learn more about that George Otis Smith guy. I just have never taken the time to do the deep dive, to get the context. And these live streams in the backyard, some of them are old hat, but some of them are a chance for me to finally, finally do something that I've been meaning to do because I happen to have a little time now, as you do. Beautiful geologic maps from more than 100 years ago and George Otis Smith is making maps really for the first time of this area. There's really hardly anything geologically written down, even in text form, before 1903. I want to find one more for you that's a favorite of mine. Can I find it easily, he asks himself. Yep. This includes the Sanford Pasture landslide down by Natchez. He's mapping a, what's called a Pena Plain, which is kind of an old idea, but I've always meant to learn more about Pena Plains and why they were such a hot topic back then, and they're not as useful, they're not as, as uh, in everybody's lingo as they are today. And then I can't hold it. I'll do just a couple more. Here's here's so I'm going to give you the context. I basically I'm going to deliver the backstory on George, the front story, if that's the word, uh, what happened after he was here in central Washington. And I've had a blast in the last 24 hours learning what I can about him. But he's in here laying the groundwork for a lot, this is the Yakima River Canyon, for a lot of the work that that we've been doing now. And by work, I'm meaning teaching, you know. I, 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 I didn't realize the extent to what George Otis Smith put this together. Okay, now I'm officially carried away, but I can't hold it. I'm gonna to try to get in real close here. Here's, here's a beautiful map to give you a feeling for the, the country that they're dealing with. I'm gonna show you the timeline of this, but George Otis Smith is walking around give or take, the year 1900, Yakima River Canyon, Mount Stewart area, up towards Wenatchee, up to Chelan. He's, this is him walking now. He's walking up at Snoqualmie Pass. I mean, he's a young guy. And look at this map. So I'm gonna put my finger on, Snoqualmie Pass is here. There's no, Railroad at Snoqualmie Pass. There's a rail going over Stampede Pass. This is the year 1900, and it's published in 1903. No roads, nothing. Amazing stuff. Uh, Bailey Willis is the second half of this, which is another vintage. So he's up at Waterville making maps like this. I got a lot of stuff for you this morning. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna spend 20 minutes on this, which I don't mean to do. But there's also, uh, Bailey has a photographer with him, or maybe he's taking photos himself, I'm not sure. So, okay, so this is what got me in to the topic of George Otis Smith. This is my only knowledge of George Otis Smith until yesterday morning. So, can I come through on my promise? of the backstory and what happened to George Otis Smith after he was here hiking the hills in central Washington. I hope so. So this intersects with some of my personal interests, mostly that I, I was interested in the 1800s 30, 40 years ago. I was really into the 1800s for a while. And uh, I'm kind of back thinking about that for the first time. So I don't know about you, but um, I was introduced long ago to these great surveys, uh, the United States now, US, US government, uh, 1860s and 1870s. I don't know if those names mean anything to you, but these are the four amazing government surveys that basically went out summer after summer the King Survey, uh, the Wheeler Party, the Hayden Party, and John Wesley Powell, famous name from Grand Canyon. So they're out with a whole team of scientists, all young guys, you know, and they're covering a lot of ground and they're creating these amazing reports of all this stuff out in the American West, post-Civil War, basically. 
uh, to put a bunch of rumors to rest. Like, <laughs> what really is out there? Can we take photos of, of the scenes, etc.? The Hayden party was successful in communicating back to Washington, D.C. about the wonders of Yellowstone, for instance, and so that was the first national park in the world in 1872, etc. Well, guess who uh, it hooks on with the USGS in, in uh, right, okay, so the USGS itself, the United States Geological Survey, starts in 1879, and Washington doesn't even become a state until 1889, and so these great surveys were great, but they really didn't cover Washington because Washington was still just kind of a territory at that time. So my first major point involving George here is that he's fresh out of college. He just gets his PhD. Let's, let's take a moment. So George Otis Smith is a guy from Maine. He was born in Maine. He died in Maine. And... He went to Colby College. If you saw the Ice Core show, we had a video clip from a gal in an Ice Core lab at Colby College. Well, here's a coincidence. Uh, that's where uh, George Otis Smith went to college back in the 1890s, I guess, 1880s maybe even. And, uh, and George Otis Smith went, got a PhD from Johns Hopkins University. Is that in Baltimore? I think it is. And so right out of PhD, he hooks on with the USGS and he spends six summers way out here in the new state of Washington. And I'm just giving you a sense of the areas that he covered. On foot, on horseback, I don't know. I was thrilled to find that all of his notebooks, you remember our Rocky Crandall show where we actually saw some of his notebooks from the 1950s in the Osceola mud flow? Uh, apparently, all of George Otis Smith's notebooks are on file or uh, in reserve at the USGS in Denver. And I think you can get access. I'm going to try to get access to those journals because I want the details. Remember, I heard the song. I want to know who was in the recording studio in 1925, Bix Beiderbecke or whatever. Um, same thing here. I want, I want day by day. I want to know who was with... George, was he busting through Ellensburg here on foot? Did he stop in for groceries a few blocks from here in downtown Main Street where my wife is doing yoga at the moment? I mean, that's my instinct. I want as many details as possible. But the point is, he's fresh out of college. He's never been out west before. And he's making incredibly detailed maps. Uh... Before we get to his incredibly detailed maps, it's not just that one thing that I have that was passed down to me from George Beck. I've got a bunch of old books that we keep in a little department library. Let me give you, before I get too deep into George Otis Smith, let me back up. And in case you are intrigued by this, in case you've not known about this or a bunch of USGS stuff from the 1800s that... I find fascinating and have never had the time to really go through carefully, but I think I might now. I think with these live streams, I've stumbled onto the idea that this human history and where we are in the country's history and old roads and that, I think it works with a lot of people. I may be wrong, but the Bing Crosby thing was kind of weird, but it seems like people really liked it. So I might do more of this in the future. So let me give you a feeling for a few of the old things that I have at my disposal, and maybe you, you do as well. Don't shame me now, okay? This is an old book. I don't have the gloves on and everything else, but I want to share a couple things with you. So there's a whole, there's three shelves of stuff that has stayed in our geology department. That it's really just me that kind of looks at them occasionally. Um, so this is Explorations and Surveys, Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is a survey done in 1855 and published in 1857. I'll just give you a little taste. So this is, this is a half a century before George, George sets foot in Washington. 
Here's some guys uh, in the Deschutes area in central Oregon with all these amazing lithographs and paintings. Don't have photography in 1850s, I don't think. I'm sure you'll correct me. And by the way, I'm hoping the live comments will be full of people who are into this stuff and they have other tips and other things to kind of, other leads basically, because I think I do want to get more and more into this. It was just, it was not just geology, so they're surveying everything. It's almost like Lewis and Clark. This is 50 years after Lewis and Clark, but they're, they're kind of Lewis and Clarky. And th this particular uh, group was looking for potential railroads to go from Sacramento Valley in Central California up to the Columbia River Gorge, which was, you know, Oregon Trail country. So they were working their way north from California to the Dalles, essentially. Uh, so a bunch of this is available online. It's something different to hold the originals. Now, if we jump ahead to the great surveys of the 1860s and 70s, there's annual reports that are amazing. Again, they've all been digitized. You can find them pretty easily. Uh, but again, this is from the collection that was given to me uh, just as the keeper of old stuff in the department. I think maybe George Beck bought these at rummage sales and stuff too. So here's from uh, 1885. So now the, the USGS is only a few years old. John Wesley Powell is the director. And you're like, annual report, that doesn't sound very interesting. Well, let me give you a little taste, because it's, it's, it's littered with very famous geologists that even I know about. Um, G.K. Gilbert is uh, studying the Quaternary Lakes of the Great Basin. I'll, I'll read your passage about Captain Dutton. Captain Dutton's preliminary study of the Hawaiian volcanoes, 1870s, um, referred to in my last report, furnished so large a mass of material suitable for immediate publication that it was thought best to defer his personal fieldwork in the Cascade Mountains until his Hawaiian papers were completed and published. A reconnaissance was made in the Cascades by J.S. Diller, who was engaged as Captain Dutton's assistant, and the mapping of the region continued. Mr. Dillard visited Mount Shasta and the southern portion of the Cascades in the 1870s now, making local observations, 1880s, uh, local observations and collecting material for lithographic study as he went, but giving a special attention to the more general relations of the volcanic and sedimentary masses so as to enable Captain Dutton to plan future work in the division intelligently. I got something else bookmarked here. Oh yeah. So here's another party heading to Rainier in 188, uh, can't remember. Have you seen old books that have these little, these little terry cloth things to protect the lithograph or whatever the right term is? Glaciers of Mount Rainier. Oh, this is Emmons's visit to Mount Rainier. There was uh, George Beck marked here. 1870. The main, this is on Mount Rainier now. The main White River Glacier, the grandest of the whole, pours straight down from the rim of the crater to a northeasterly direction. That's where Rocky Crandall was making his discoveries about the Osceola. Its greatest width on the steep slope of the mountain must be four or five miles, narrowing towards its extremity to about a mile and a half. The length can scarcely be less than 10 miles. The great eroding power of the glacial ice is strikingly illustrated in this glacier, which seems to have cut down and carried away as shown by the walls on either side. Of the thickness of the ice of the glacier, I have no data for making estimates, though it may probably be reckoned in thousands of feet. All right, so my point is there have been a few exploration people in the Pacific Northwest before George Otis Smith shows up in 1896 for the first time, but it's, as I understand it, just pretty much reports in these little annual surveys.
can't hold it. Uh, people send me things. I'm very grateful. This somebody sent me about uh, a journal of Thomas Simmons, who came down the Columbia. Eric sent this to me. A report of the examinations of the Upper Columbia River. So there's hand-drawn sketches of the Columbia in 1880-whatever, and it'd be fun to go out to different spots, the Nespelum Canyon up by Grand Coulee Dam. So there's all these little fragments. This is me talking now. These little fragments of things in my head from different snapshots in time. I want to do the broad, deep dive with each of those things and eventually kind of bring some of those things together for a general audience. I'm kind of sharing my tentative thoughts with you about that. I'm scattered, but who cares? Oh, we're getting dark here. Um, another tip for you. You looking for a good book? Uh, I, I read this when I was in my 20s. Time Exposure, the autobiography of William Henry Jackson. He lived to 99 years old. He was a painter from the Northeast. He battled at Gettysburg. He got hooked on to the Hayden Party, those one of those four great surveys, and he was taking photographs of Yellowstone and the Tetons. And his photographs were absolutely incredible and uh, held up so well. He's hauling around these big wet plates on his mule and everything, you know. And uh, his autobiography is especially well done. There's another guy named William that I often get confused in my mind because it's also in the mid-1800s. He wasn't a scientist, William Lewis Manley, but this is another great book, Death Valley in 1949, in 1849, excuse me. Uh, Manley walked. Uh, did he? Well, he somehow got from Wisconsin. So my dad was very fond of this book because Manley was describing walking basically through our farm area in southern Wisconsin in 1849. And then Manley gets himself to Salt Lake City and then he gets lost trying to take a shortcut down to Los Angeles and he almost starves to death and gets into Death Valley, barely alive with a friend, and then he vividly describes showing up in Los Angeles and eating too much immediately and getting sick because he could finally drink and eat beef and great stuff. And John Muir, there, there's all these little kind of fragments of things since we're talking about fragments. So here's uh, other names that I've meant to look into. Bailey Willis, an important geologist. Israel Russell. I might do a program on each of these at some point. I don't know. But if you are a fan of this kind of stuff, uh, or if you're not, but you're kind of open to learning about a new set of ideas, uh, this is a real fun thing to do. Now, let's finally get to George Otis Smith, 925. Am I going to get wet? Let's pick up the story now. So just to finish George's life, and then I think we'll spend the, the last part of our time together talking about the details of what I know so far about George in central Washington. So George, spends six summers in central Washington creating some amazing geologic maps and reports lays the groundwork essentially for what we know now about central Washington geology. But he only is out in the field uh, less than a decade. It's just six summers. And then he moves into administration and he goes back east and he's on the east coast the rest of his life, more or less. And at the ripe old age of, you can do the math, 30-whatever, uh, he becomes the head of the USGS. And he's leading the U.S. the Geological Survey from 1907 until 1930. And during that time, he's involved in Teapot Dome. He's, he's testifying with the teapot, teapot Dome scandal involving oil and, and uh, greed. Uh, he's also involved in the demise of Gordon Pinch, uh, Gifford Pinchot. So, I mean, this guy who, you know, was, was walking around uh, Menashtash Ridge and up by Mount Stewart uh, in his 20s, 
uh, pretty quickly is on a national stage and involved with many of these things. And notice what happens late in his career. He leaves the USGS in 1930. He becomes part of the, he becomes the new chair of the newly formed Federal Power Commission. And he's involved in the uh, initial planning of the Grand Coulee Dam. So like one of his last major chapters of his career is back in Washington. I'm not sure physically, but uh, listening to these dreams of, of making this irrigation project and creating electricity with Grand Coulee Dam. All right, so little samples that I know about Smith. So his first uh, couple of months out here in 1896, he's assisting Bailey Willis. I need to know more about Willis. But they're up at Rainier. And I know that it's fun for me. I don't know if it's fun for you. So online you can find all of these old reports. So now George has been with the U.S. Geological Survey for a few years. This is the 1898-1899 report. And you can, uh, and oh, by the way, so here's, here's just a descriptor of the, the, the guys who have their own party. So these are like miniature parties. These aren't the great surveys now, but these are parties where they're split up across the country and doing more surveying on a more local scale. And so the Diller parties in Oregon, the George Otis Smith parties in Washington, the Russell party, Israel Russell is also in Washington. Look at these maps. So the work of George Otis Smith and Israel Russell and Bailey Willis convinces the U.S. to make a Mount Rainier National Park. So it's kind of similar to Jackson who helped, and, and, and uh, who's the painter? Can't think of the painter with, with uh, the Hayden survey, Moran. Uh, they helped convince setting a land aside there. So I enjoy Rainier like most of us do, uh, in part because there's old growth timber, there's, hasn't been logged. It's, it's, it's a living museum. Uh, to the days of these guys walking around. And of course, to the days of Native Americans who enjoyed this area for thousands of years. I'm here, I might as well show you later. And so now this is, this is uh, George later in life. He's in Washington, D.C. He's the head of the USGS and then eventually part of the Federal Commission. It's amazing what you can find. Here's uh, when George not flipping you off. When George uh, takes over the Federal Power Commission, there's his wife and his daughter. New Englanders. And here's from June of 1933. George in advanced years now, Federal Power Commission. And they're doing the paperwork to get approval from the Federal Power Commission, I guess that's how it worked, to create Grand Coulee Dam. First official step to build Grand Coulee Dam in Columbia River is taken by Senator Clarence Dill, showing presenting Chairman George Otis Smith of Federal Power Commission with application of permit. Other members present are James O'Sullivan, O'Sullivan Dam, Secretary of the Columbia Basin Commission, uh, McNich and Draper, okay. So it's fun. I got help from Andy and Cleellan, by the way. Andy sent me some good links about the testimony of, of um, George Otis Smith at a meeting in Spokane about the ouster of Pencho. And then this teapot dome thing is a different story, which I know very little about. But from those annual reports, here's some details. So here's the summer of 1898 from one of those annual reports. The Smith Party. Mr. George Otis Smith, under the general direction of Mr. Bailey Willis, so I need to do more on Willis, 
was engaged in detailed work on the Mount Stewart Quadrangle, Kittitas County, Washington, but its completion was rendered impossible on account of snow. And field work was stopped October 14th, 1898. And then it skips, uh, then they talk about drafting reports, etc. A collection of rocks from the Northern Cascades was examined for Professor Israel C. Russell and a report thereon submitted. And the manuscript of the report, okay. Mr. Willis joined Mr. Smith in the Mount Stewart Quadrangle and devoted three weeks between September 7th and October 13th, before the snow hit, to detailed observations, chiefly on stratigraphy and structure of the Eocene and later coal-bearing strata. So we had a, a whole plant fossils live stream. And these are the kinds of rocks that were being studied by George. I'm having fun. And you're like, well, God, wouldn't it be cool to see one of those like old maps like from Ellensburg or from Mount Stewart that uh, George was able to publish in 1903 and picking up I don't want to destroy this now you got to be you got to be generous with me now okay I, I can't handle the the reprimands I'm a big boy but I'm afraid of gorilla man and uh, I also don't like the scolding that's just me these were also passed down to me from George Beck so, a detailed topographic map for the first time of the Mount Stewart Folio, as they called it. To this day, this is still the best map of the Liberty area where Rob Reppin does his gold mining. And can you see, I don't know if I can come any closer, I, don't, I, I wanna treat this very carefully. You see all those red lines so George and Frank Calkins are on foot or horseback or whatever, mapping every one of those Tianaway flood basalt feeder dikes. This is still the best map we've got. I can't emphasize that enough. Now we have a new geologic mapper in Ellensburg who may eventually get up there and uh, make a new map, I'm trying to convince him to do that. Economic geology, same general area. And it was fashionable in the day to make cross sections as well and kind of plaster them right onto the geologic map. So this is an original from 1904 that I knew we had, but I didn't really know it was George Otis Smith until I, I uh, put two and two together. I think that was a couple of years ago. You wanna see another one? This one's a, a little bit more fragile. Same format, a couple big pages, but these are such, they're so huge. But here's George and Frank Calkins. You see the pink there? 
Any guesses what the pink is? It's a titanandesite, man. Now, this is long before Daryl Gussie can actually get samples and get absolute ages and figure out specifics about the titanandesite, but it was, it was George Otis Smith that mapped and coined the name titanandesite. And Ellensburg's up here at the top, so they're, they're humping over Menash Tash and Umtanum and Clown. This is the summer of 1900. They're not driving around. I'm curious how they got around. Okay. If that wasn't enough, I got a couple final things I want to do with you. Um, I just had an idea. Hang on. I'm skipping around. Please apologize. Please, please accept my apology. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I think I want to. We're not going to the cozy fort, but I do have one thing for you from the internet. I'm back to this guy. So I'm Googling last night. I'm like, what was that book? I love that book about this guy who went out with the Oregon Trail. He's bushwhacking his way to Salt Lake, and then he starts taking photos uh, in the 1870s, Civil War vet, et cetera. I typed into YouTube, William Henry Jackson. Guess what I found? You can do it right now if you want. I, I wasn't even gonna do this, so I need to open up a new window, get rid of the live chat for a second. It's so painful, make me go away. I'm gonna just hide me in the side. I'm going to YouTube. Typing in, are you gonna beat me? William Henry Jackson. Rare audio interview with Old West photographer William Henry Jackson. 1941, you're gonna hear William Henry Jackson talk. He died three years later, four years later. He's talking about his days in the 1870s. He even talks about the Civil War, but we're not gonna do that. I just want you to listen to this guy. Talk about magic. I don't know if I can easily, I can't probably find the Hayden part. Let's try it. Yeah, they went to the wheat crop. On the first year of their entrance into Salt Lake Valley, they had a wheat crop growing at once. They're showing the wheat and corn, I should say, besides the wheat. Let's see. What do you recall, Mr. Jackson, is, in your opinion, the most interesting thing that uh, happened to you in your entire experience in the West? Do you have any one thing that you think would be an outstanding Well, it's experience? pretty hard to segregate uh, one, one item because my uh, <coughs> experience has been so... <coughs> you want a glass of been so wide, so Yes, general. that's him. Just, that's right. Just take a drink. Okay. But I've always called the most interesting period of my life, the 10 years I spent in the West with the Hayden Survey. Oh, good. That's always been my most interesting period. New things at its own, new places to photograph, first things to bring to the attention of the world, to make the Ellisbonne region known, to make the mountain to Holy Cross known, to, the, to make known to the people the trip dwellings of the South. All very interesting in them, things in themselves, but no one startling, dramatic, single incident, you might say. You have a pro he writes beautifully. If you can find that autobiography, it's excellent. It's just fun to hear a guy who was alive. He was in his 20s fighting the Gettysburg. Crazy. I'm going to finish with this, and then we'll do live q and I don't know what you want to ask, and I don't know what I have to answer, but we'll try it anyway. About four years ago, I had uh, a guy email me an essay written by George Otis Smith entitled 
Plain geology. P-L-A-I-N. And the guy emailed me the essay for reasons that will probably be obvious to you. But I want to read uh, portions of this to you. And then we'll open it up to you. I hope you can see, I'm just getting started learning about George Otis Smith. And my next move, when I have a little bit more time, is to try to get a hold of those journals, digital copies of those journals, from his six summers with his assistants, and where exactly they went, and just bring that, bring this area to life with vivid detail, instead of just saying, yeah, they were probably walking around, and they probably had horses or mules, or they were camping. I want, I want more than that, and maybe that would really work, especially with local folks. Okay, so this is George Otis Smith talking to a group of economic geologists in 1921. So he's speaking, he wrote this speech out, and, he's, he's, and it's called Plain Geology. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll read you a couple passages. I'm impressed with George Otis Smith for many reasons. Now remember, now he's the head of the USGS now. He's, he's uh, more than a decade past walking around making geologic maps here. Here's George. Some years ago, I spoke to an audience of mining men on the subject of plain writing. My talk was an appeal for the simple and direct statement of scientific thought in popular language. But that appeal was addressed to consumers of geological literature, and I should probably do better to make a similar appeal to some of the producers of geological literature. This is 1921. I am convinced that at its best, science is simple. That the simplest arrangement of facts that sets forth the truth best deserves this term scientific. So the, geolo so the geology I plead for, that which states facts in plain words, in language understood by the many rather than only by the few, plain geology needs little defining, and I may state my case best, and he goes on and on, he goes on and on, he goes on and on. I have a very definitive, oh no, I want to read that one portion for you, hang on. <laughs> I got all this stuff. Why not? First of all, I suppose we may as well admit a certain liking for the sound of words. And the longer the word, the more sound it has. Especially enjoyable is this mild form of hypnotism if both ideas and words are such as to make us feel that we are moving in the highest circles. At the meeting of the British Association this year, one physicist frankly explained that the idea of relativity, the idea of relativity is popular because to most people, it is pleasantly incomprehensible. It was a hardened reader of manuscripts. It was a hardened reader of manuscripts who confessed that he liked to hear a psychologist talk. Of course, I understand not a word he is saying, but it is a noble and inspiring spectacle to see a mere human crack a whip over an entire vocabulary and see the words jump on their little red chairs like so many trained seals. But as I wish to suggest, doing tricks with words may be more entertaining than really useful. He goes on with some examples, but he gets a little snarky here at the end. I have a very definite purpose for this appeal to plain geology that a larger part of people can understand. Today our science has more contact with life than ever before. Industry has taken geology into partnership, and engineers and capitalists and statesmen all look to geologists for advice. This greater demand has called to the ranks many with varying degrees of professional incompetence, a polite phrase by which I mean in plain English that some who call themselves geologists are knaves, others are fools, and yet others are hybrids. Now the universal camouflage of the fake geologist, whether of the untaught or uncaught variety, 
is his protecting coloring of technical words. To his clients or his dupes who are weak in geological knowledge, these long and unusual words are impressive and serve his purpose. But to those who have the advantage of special training and experience, his use of geologic terms at once exposes his true character. Indeed, this is the basis of the practical test that some of us apply to the report in an oil prospectus. If, as so commonly happens, we have never heard of the so-called well-known authority on the geology of the greatest oil fields of the world. Such, a expert use, such an expert uses all the latest terms, but he mixes their meanings. His report is senseless, and we know him to be a faker. But I have yet to note the fake geologist imitating plain statements of geological facts. That kind of masterpiece he doesn't attempt to copy. So I suggest this method of protecting our useful science from the successful imitation. The economic geologist should tell his story in plain English. Then because the transparency of this statement, his clients or public can see things as they are and will learn to refuse the highly colored substitute offered by his quack imitators. There's really something of an obligation upon us, both as scientists and as, and as partners in the world's business, to show the world that geology is not mystery or magic, but only common sense. I have told practical men of business that they should give little credence to the geologist who cannot tell his story in common language. The world has a right to discount our usefulness and even to distrust our honesty if we persist in concealing our thoughts or lack of thoughts behind a mask of professional jargon. The lawyers and the physicians whom I trust most can and do explain their technicalities to me in words that I can understand. Isn't plain geology the safest and most useful kind? George Otis Smith, 1921. It's time for some question and answer. I hope that you have a few comments or questions and we can roll with that. Let me grab my laptop. Storms are brewing. I gotta get these documents. If I even feel a drop, I'm gonna take a break and, and run these precious things inside. Okay. I'm about going to the live chat, popping it out like a boss, right between the eyes. If you're new to us, we ask questions in uppercase. Children, feel free to ask questions. I'll try to get as many as I can in a few minutes, and then we'll call it a morning. Am I the senior geology professor at CWU? Uh, there's a few of us, Eric, who are about the same age. We're in our late 50s. And um, I've been here longer than anybody else. Um, I stopped at a master's degree, though. I don't have a PhD. So rank-wise, um, I'm pretty much the janitor. Scrolling problems. What else is new? I don't know what SpaceX is. Are there rated erratic out of just out of the Tenasket? No response needed. Doesn't make sense to me. What's happening here? Am I too far back? Or nobody has questions? I'm sorry, I'm back now. Okay. Thank you, Diane. I will. Hang on, let me move the, the precious stuff inside. Okay.
Thanks for waiting. How do geologists take their field observations into such detailed maps? Cecilia, um, uh, I'm going to ask a geologist to come over and show you how he does that. It's easier to do it that way. Are those original topographic maps available online? There's an amazing amount online, Jason. Um, I don't know. Uh, it feels like certain folks at the USGS are kind of archivists. And at least for me, it's not easy to find this stuff. I'm maybe not as good as I could be search-wise. Uh, but there's more and more stuff available online, it feels like. People are shouting at me to take the stuff inside. Okay, I did, thankfully. You can stop shouting now. Uh, yeah, it is starting to rain. Everybody can th I'm gonna, we're going to go into the mudroom. Hang on. Everything else can get wet, that's fine. I'll be right back. Okay, you ready? We're going inside. Field trip. Still there? Okay. Let's do a few more. Patrick, age six, who has been your favorite old geologist to learn about? Do you have a hero in geology or in general? My favorite old geologist, um, Patrick, I'm such a fan of so many people that um, I don't think I have one favorite. Uh, George Otis Smith would be right in there, but good question. I don't have a, a good answer for you. Uh, some people are having buffering problems. Try to reload, refresh, etc. Uh Robert says, why not get my PhD? Kids are grown. Uh, I could give you a long answer to that, Robert, but um, I guess I won't. Uh, I'm doing what I want to be doing. You could get a real dark uh, answer from me, but not, not appropriate here. Oh, a bunch of you are asking that. How was per Smith perceived as a government official? Um, I just got a taste of that, but I think he was a partner to business. I think he was a, a fan of not only plain geology, but I think he wanted to make geology a working partner with commerce. 
And so as a result, I think he sometimes sided on, uh, uh, maybe inappropriate here, but he may have been interested in siding on opening up some, some uh, protected land. I don't know about that, but um, he was not an academic, shall we say. Did That's not fair to say, but he was, a, as you read more about him, he was a, a, a fan of, of business. Uh, did George Otis Smith map the North Cascades Highway area? In general, he did. Um, one of those summers, he and Frank Calkins were up by Baker, and they were working up along the international border. Um, so they got around. Those guys got around, and occasionally they would get together with Bailey Willis or Israel Russell, and they would kind of compare notes and help each other out. But it's just a handful of people, young, young guys out there mapping. No reason, no reason to apologize, Mark. I, I caught the joke later on. Sorry I snapped at you. Uh, why not dart under the garage roof much closer? I don't think that quickly, John. Uh, did the geologist travel with surveyors? Good question, Barry. I, I, uh, I don't know. I don't have that figured out. Uh, what if I do this? I'm just experimenting now. Kind of fun. Give you something better to look at than a dark mudroom. Did George, o George Otis Smith drill and install any USGS brass markers in Washington? That's kind of along the lines of the surveying stuff, Bob. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't think so. You know, they describe in those annual reports the Smith party. Now, is it really like the great surveys where you have a whole team of people with specializations? I don't think so. But I would very, I'd love to see those, those, those notebooks. That should make it very clear. Uh, I don't know where I'm at, 9.55, I'm five minutes ago. Okay, did uh, George choose to explore Washington because he was aware of the geologic diversity? Justin Simpson, muffler boy. That's another angle that's helpful that I don't have. Is it a simple, let's go inventory our resources? You know, and as I've gotten uh, closer to some of the Native Americans in the area, I'm thinking of them always. <laughs> I used to really think highly of these, these guys coming in doing all these amazing surveys, but uh, let's not get politics into it. But basically, I, a lot of those surveys are just saying, hey, what, what do we got here? What can we, what can we extract uh, for our industries? I'm not sure if that was the plan for Washington or not. Uh, part of it was railroad exploration. Part of it maybe was just inventorying uh, how much gold, how much silver, how much coal, etc. cetera. Uh, so your comments and questions, uh, I might not have answers for, but it's interesting to see what you're curious about. I assume we're still working, aren't we? Okay. What's my opinion on corporate versus academic geology? I've been in academia my whole life, Gene. Oh, why not? You're all asking me about it. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble with people that I work with who I like. Listen, academia is a cult. Once you get into the cult, you all talk the same, you all speak the same language, you all kind of try to work and publish things and kind of impress each other. It's just a big board game that you're all playing. And it's getting tenure and it's, it's uh, advancing in the academic world and it's a rather small world. Um, early on, I saw that game wasn't for me. 
I had the abilities, but I didn't want to go deeply into the cult and never get out. So I, I found I, that teaching was natural for me and I wanted to teach at a university. And everybody I knew said, you're never gonna get a job at a university. You're, not, you're never gonna get tenure. I don't know why you're thinking about doing that. And I said, well, maybe somebody be willing to at least hire me. It won't be tenure, but maybe I can do it long enough where it can be relatively um, stable. And this school has been very supportive. And the people I work with have been very supportive, but I'm, I'm not playing the board game that everybody else is. I kind of wrote my own board game, wrote my own rules, and uh, it's been deeply satisfying. But that said, people in academia don't really pay attention to what I'm doing or understand what I'm doing because it, it's a different thing that I'm doing. So I, I commonly get, well, can I find somebody else who's doing what you're doing in my state? And um, I haven't found anybody doing what I'm doing because I'm, I'm in this sweet spot between the, the good things about being at, in academia and uh, the good things about being in a, in a place with real world issues. Probably shouldn't have shared that, but whatever. A uh, couple more and we'll quit. I'm really having my scrolling issues today. When early, Daryl, when early cartographer surveyors moved into a new area, how did they approach the task? Right. That shouldn't be too hard to figure out. I mean, the details of these topographic maps from more than a hundred years ago, they had guys out there simply making topographic maps. I mean, that was part of the Brett story that Brett's was, you know, waiting for the next quad to come out so he could actually see places that he wanted to go explore. And yeah, I'll have this geologist over who's talking about field mapping today, but uh, you know, I was taught the old ways of, of making geologic maps on contour line maps. Lorraine says, George Otis Smith was not USGS head in 1922 to 1923. Do I know why? No, I don't. That's about the time of the Teapot Dome scandal and maybe he was, took a year off to participate in that somehow. If I had to specialize in geology in an area different than Eastern Washington, what area would it be and why? Bradley, age 38. Oh, there's so many areas, Brad. Um, British Columbia. Brogan wants to photobomb now. Sorry. If you have tips on how to get successfully into some of these archives a little bit more efficiently than I've used, I'd be happy to uh, hear about it. Did George Smith, Bill from uh, Ephrata, did George Otis Smith survey the Grand Coulee or Moses Coulee? I don't think so. Uh, for whatever reason, his six summers were in the Cascades or the foothills of the Cascades. And I know of nobody of his vintage out there in Eastern Washington. Maybe that's why Brett's was at it. I think that is why Brett's had so much success. He was mapping from scratch. Never thought about that, Bill, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're, liter we're, we're less than five people who are doing this geologic mapping uh, before 1920, really, as I understand it now. Couple more, we'll quit. Patrick, how many teachers are in my family? What subjects do they teach? I love teachers. My wife teaches at the Ellensburg High School, just a few blocks from here. She teaches anatomy and physiology and psychology, biological angle to it, and teaches biology. She's 
much smarter than I am. My dad taught uh, biology at the high school back in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, and then got into administration. My mom taught physical education at an elementary school for more than 40 years. And she watches all these. She's decided not to log in anymore. It's too much, too, too visible for her. Uh, and my wife's sisters uh, are teachers as well. And my sister is an administrator in Phoenix. So a lot of teachers in my family, Patrick. One more. I got I to gotta do one more. Hang on. I've seen the same four questions over and over again. Okay. Uh, the Device 9 says the history of the USGS might make an interesting show. In general, I agree. I, I do think, from my point of view, taking individual people and putting them in a particular place is kind of my my taste but yeah by doing that we could kind of make that work okay how uh, that's how we'll finish maury longo says has mapping changed since the day of george otis smith um thursday night next week we're going to have a young geologic mapper with us who has an office down the hall from me and um he's going to share how things are different now than they were in George Otis Smith's time. A toast to you. have a nice storm here today. That'll be fun to watch. Uh, you're welcome to come back tomorrow morning, Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, whether we're in the backyard or the front porch, we will be doing a lot of plate tectonic drawing. And really talking about what we know about plate tectonics. Of course, George Otis Smith didn't know anything about plate tectonics. We'll update what we know about plate tectonic reconstructions over the last 100 million years. Here's to you and your health. And the health of all of us, whether you're like our county that's just starting to slowly open up a little bit, or whether you're still firmly in lockdown, hang in there. Muffler boy, hang in there. We'll eventually get back to better times ahead. Thanks for joining us this morning. An unusual episode. Hope that you enjoyed it. We'll see you tomorrow morning. I love you.